stream, which I think is actually Facebook. I don't know how they're doing that. How do they convert that from live stream through YouTube to Facebook? You're supposed to know all of this, but you're my helper. <laughs> you're supposed to know this stuff. So we're glad to see everybody here tonight, and uh, some folks are going to still be coming in as we get going. And this is Table Talk, and we've been having a good time in here the last few weeks. This is a little bit different than when I was doing it at home, I can tell you that. The best thing about doing it at home was the coffee pot was right there. And I have to just settle for water. Here it is right here. So. <laughs> And my little dog was always interrupting, but, uh, but not anymore. So, we're glad that each of you are here tonight. Yes. What? You're muted. muted. Oh, jeez. You got to push the button, high-tech stuff, you know. How about now? There you go. Very good. So I was on and turned myself off. That's not good, good, good. So, we got something interesting we're going to get into tonight. We do. So what did you, you read it? So what do you what what is I, your well, how are you going to launch this for them? <laughs> well, uh, we're going. I to asked pick them. Up. On, I asked them today. How many of you saw my little thing this afternoon? Anybody see that? Did you see my little um, update this afternoon that I was talking? Nobody's watching that. Look at why do I do that? Nobody's watching it. And nobody, nobody. Wow, maybe no. somebody out there is watching it, but. All right. The, uh, I asked the question, you know, what would it be like to have God to call you a fool? Wow. Well, we're following up from last week's uh, uh, lesson on giving up mm. all that you have so That's that right. you can be a disciple of Christ. Right. And uh, now we need to find out what really does that mean? How you flesh that out. How does it work? Okay, we're going to do that. Let's start with prayer tonight. Can we do that? Let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to meet with us and be with us as we do our time together once again on these startling stories. We call them the parables, and they are absolutely amazing. Father, we do thank You for this time that You've given us to come together tonight, and thank You for these that are gathered. Uh, Lord, I know there are other things that are attracting people right now. Um, there's basketball finals going on, and baseball going on, and football going on, and and uh, what wasn't going on and was distracting any, anybody back a few months ago is everything's cranked up again. And in addition, Lord, the, the COVID scare is still going on. Lord, uh, we just thank you that, that we can just uh, stop, settle down, and settle in and see what your word has to say. Thank you for the technology that allows us to come into the homes of people as well as to talk to people that are present right here in front of us. Now, as we open your word tonight, I pray that we would always recognize that it is the word of God, the eternal word of God. And um, this, during this study, we're, we're listening to Jesus himself. We know everything is God's word, but we, we happen to be listening and studying the stories that Jesus told while he was on earth and interacting directly with other human beings, him being in human flesh at that point. So bless us in our time together tonight. Help us as we look into your word, and we just thank you for this time together. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what do you think about that idea of God calling somebody a fool? Well, uh, we're talking about money. Yeah. And uh, I, I got to think that uh, money is one of the uh, most common idols that we face today, particularly in the United States. As rich as a nation as we are, mm -hmm. we always focus on money and how much we have and how much we don't have and how much we want. Yeah. A lot of times when, when we talk about God and we talk about His chief rival, a lot of times people, you know, we get in our mind, well, God's chief rival is the devil. That, that is not true. For the loyalty of mankind, God's chief rival is what? Money. You cannot serve God and money. And so, uh, what are the three? We looked at it last week. We talked about it. Those who did not put him first among all the relationships, they couldn't be his disciple. Those that did not put Jesus first before all their personal plans or goals, they couldn't be his disciple. And then the third one that we're going to expand on tonight, those who did not put at his disposal all of their earthly possessions. It was very interesting, and I, I even wrote down on here that it was interesting, and it was also very convicting, even convicting to me, 
Because, you know, it's easy to just, you know, look at yourself and think, well, you know, I'm not rich. I don't have a lot. But the truth is, how, have, you ever, have you ever gone on that website, the global rich list, and put in your annual income to see where you fall in the world's, the world's income? Everybody in this room, I am sure, everybody in this room, if you were to punch in your annual income, would be in the top 2% wage earners in the world. Think about that. So uh, it was very convicting. You know, sometimes we think, you know, well, you know, there's, we can justify anything. And we think, yeah, well, there's always, you know, uh, I can always find a justification for the money that I have. Well, the story we're going to look at tonight talks about that. So I want to look at this startling story that kind of expands on those last, the last of those three regarding earthly possessions. That verse that we looked at was back in Luke 14, 33. Likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. We read it from a few versions, and the NASB, New American Standard, says this. It says that it's not so much that we forsake or that we, uh, th- that we give away, but rather that we give up. To give away means it's no longer, no longer in our administration and we don't have it to serve the Lord with. To give up means that we give up ownership and uh, we stop trying to own and we start taking up stewardship. Uh, and that is administration of what God has put into our hands. So tonight we, we need to get the setting uh, of what was going on. Luke chapter 11 in verse 53. You got it on your sheet right there. Why don't you read do. that for us? 53, 54. Luke 11, 50, 53, 54. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say that they might accuse him. Okay. You're familiar with that terminology, cross-examine? I, I've done it a few times, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've been on that end asking questions of people, and uh, that is what was going on right there. Well, what was the problem? Why was it that they were cross-examining him? Uh, I, I have to stop right here, and I have to say this. This is, this is pretty interesting. We're going to see this in uh, chapter 11 and verse number 32. So look in, and we're going to look in Luke. It's, our main passage is chapter 12. But I wish that you'd look at chapter 11 for just a minute, verse number 37. Uh, It says in verse 37, it says, As he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went and sat down to eat. Do you know that in uh, in this study that we've done on the parables, that this is the third time that Jesus sat down at a dinner? And so basically what we're reading and studying is table talk. (laughs) This time is Jesus' table talk. And so it's just kind of funny. I thought we're calling my little study here table talk and uh, started way back in the house. But Jesus did his own table talk. And uh, it's interesting just how much God accomplished over a good meal. Well, here we are. So Jesus was a popular guest. He was. He was highly sought after. They kept inviting him over and over. It must have been because he was so gracious and... uh, humble and, and honored his uh, host. No, I think they were trying to get him in, get him in their circumstances and try to get him to mess up and try to say something that they could accuse him. Uh, so this Pharisee in verse 37 made the mistake of inviting him for dinner and uh, they were upset at him. They were dismayed that he had not washed his hands according to their traditions. Now, uh, it is a good idea for hygiene uh, to wash your hands. How many of you have washed your hands more during the last, the last uh, six or seven months than you have at any time in your life because of the COVID thing? Man, I have, I have washed my hands. I, don't, I, don't, I have this little jar in my uh, office here in the church. And on Sunday, uh, when I'm shaking hands, I'm not supposed to shake hands, but I mean, people grab my hand whether I want to shake it or not, and they hug me, do everything, and we're distancing. Well, I don't know what it's going to be like whenever we're not distancing, but, uh, but I go in my, and I wash my hands. I'm in the office. I go out and, during the week. I'm working with other people. So I got this little thing of dial soap. Now, I'm an old guy. I love dial soap. It's my favorite. So I have this little thing of dial soap. I just had, I just had Harold put the second full gallon of that stuff in my office to refill since March. And that <laughs> I am going through that stuff, washing hands. Now, it's one thing to wash our hands so that they be clean. But when you think about this and you understand this, the tradition of the elders, the hand washing, 
they had a system whereby they would, they would dip their hands into the waters and wait until the 16th drop fell off of their elbows before they did it again. And they did that 12 times in order to make sure they had washed according to the tradition of the elders. And so they had these rituals that they were going in. I picture Jesus going in, sit down, and he looks for the wash basin, washes his hands, and sits down to eat. And they're all just amazed at him because he's not doing it according to the tradition of the elders. They're furious with him. He did not wash. It says, when the Pharisees saw it, uh, he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisees saw it and marveled that he had not washed before dinner. I don't think Jesus didn't wash his hands. I think he just didn't follow the traditions that they were they had set up for him. So what did he do? He appointed out their hypocrisy. He labeled them as fools. He said they were full of greed, full of pride, and were easily offended. Why would you keep inviting this guy to dinner? That's I mean, this is, he just keeps doing this over and over. So the scribes now, the scribes, people like Eric. Oh, excuse me. I hey, didn't mean to say that. <laughs> so he's a lawyer. The scribes were lawyers. So no, they the, were teachers of the law. Let's teachers of the right. law. So they got <laughs> offended. They got offended because he lumped them in with the Pharisees. And what did he do? Well, he revealed their woeful hypocrisy. Um, and so look if, look if you would in the passage there. Um, Verse 45, it says in 1145, one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. And he just goes, he lights into him. He says, Woe you, woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens to bear, and you yourselves don't touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You build the tombs of the prophets and so on. And so... Who would uh, have thought the lawyers would be compared to pastors? That's just... <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. So he said they laid heavy burdens on the people. They wouldn't carry them themselves. They hypocritically built tombs to the prophets. You say, why was it hypocritical? Because they were well known for building tombs to people like, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and some of those that they had actually killed. The Bible mentions some names of people that were martyred. And, and so they built the tombs to these prophets that their forefathers had actually killed. And so they were acting like they venerated these prophets when in truth they were just the descendants of those who had killed them. They also, it says, they closed up the kingdom of heaven to the people that were seeking it. It says they took the keys to the kingdom and hid them so that people couldn't find how, how to get into the kingdom of heaven. That's why they were seeking to destroy him. They wanted to trap him, discredit him, and destroy him. And so they kept inviting him to dinner. And um, it's not, it's never, it's never a good proposition to think you can get into some sort of word discussion with Jesus and come out on the, come out on the winning side. So uh, they did not do that. So in chapter 12, verse 1, I want you to look at that. It says, in the meantime, while an, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, how many was that? So that they trampled on one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So, I, 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 once again, we see that the rejection by the Pharisees and by the scribes and by the religious elite, the ones that were rejecting him, had no influence over the people. By the time that you come to the first century, the temple and all of its, everything that was going on there was apostate. It was no longer the Judaism of the Old Testament. Not the ceremony, not the law keeping, nothing. Everything was about money. The Herodians had made the link between Herod and the temple, and they were, they were, it was a money making operation, and that's all it was. That's why. Whenever they, Jesus kept doing all these miracles and his crowds began to kept growing, they said, we've got to do something about this because we're going to lose our place, our position, and our situation. They were upset. What did they mean? We're going to lose influence, we're going to lose power, and mostly we're going to lose our income because people are listening to him and they're no longer listening to us. That is exactly where this thing came to. So the crowds weren't discouraged. They, they'd had enough with these, these priests and Levites and all these different ones. So the people were stepping on, to, on each other to get to Jesus. And so Jesus starts teaching them. He says, look, don't be hypocrites like the Pharisees and uh, watch out for leaven. And so you know what leaven does. What is, some of you ladies, tell me what is the characteristic of leaven? What does it do? What does it do? 
It, it rises. But when you put it in a, a mass, a, a lump of dough, what, what does it do? You work it, right? You work it and you knead it. And so the leaven is intended to penetrate, to permeate, and to, to have a full effect on the, you don't want just a little bit of leaven. You put it in there and you move it around so that leaven is like that. He says, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, this is not, a, this is not teaching against, against using leaven in your bread. This is using it as an illustration. It's simply saying that like leaven completely permeates dough, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and Sadducees and all the rest of these C's, they can, their hypocrisy, once it enters, it can permeate and penetrate and it completely take over. I want to pull over and just say something right here. Do you think, do you think that hypocrisy um, has an increasingly permeating and penetrating effect in our world today, even in churches? Do you think once it starts, it grows? You watched they, a debate last night? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> a but, prime example. Yeah, but it, I'm, I'm talking about even in the church. Yeah. So Jesus was teaching about this more and more. He said, don't fear man, fear God. Don't be ashamed of Christ before man or Jesus will be ashamed of you before God. Confess him openly. Don't worry about what you say when you get brought before the authorities. He's talking to this, these masses and to his disciples. So right as Jesus was teaching about hypocrisy, and here's the setting He's in a debate, he's talking, he's teaching the people, he has corrected the Pharisees, he's corrected the scribes, now he's teaching the multitudes what to watch out for, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees, and in the middle of all of that comes Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Let's read it. Luke 12, 13. It says, in the middle of the teaching, then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So, I mean, imagine if I'm preaching on Sunday morning and I'm preaching on, you know, I don't know, Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, and I'm talking about the fact that, you know, heaven and hell and, you know, people are standing at the great white throne judgment and the angels are going to look in the book of life. What if somebody just says, hey, pastor, pastor, before you go any further, you know what? My mom died and my dad had already died and there's an inheritance and my, my older brother won't even give me the time of day. He's not going to give, he's taking it all. Will you please... Pastor Phil, will you tell him what would be the reason for that? Well, watch this for a minute. Just think about this. Um, <clears throat> and this is amazing. Huge crowds are in attendance, so many that they couldn't find anywhere to stand. He was doing amazing works. He was teaching vital truth. So one in the crowd saw this. He saw that Jesus taught with authority. He saw that the Pharisees were no match for him. And he saw that everybody was listening to him. He said, man, this guy, he's the guy. Maybe my brother will listen to him. And so he can get my brother straightened out and I can get some of that inheritance. Does anybody have a thought about, maybe you have a thought. Do you have a thought about why he would, what is the deal? Why is he saying he wants, I want him to divide the inheritance with me? What, what do you think is going on? Well, back in, in that time, yeah. the older brother or the oldest brother right. inherited what, two-thirds yeah. of the uh, money that was available from the parents. Yeah. So this guy was obviously a younger brother ah. uh, who didn't have the authority to handle the estate or make the distribution. So ah. he needed somebody with authority to yep. get up there and get him moving. He wanted him to break the system. You know, he said, hey, this isn't any good. I mean, you know, he's, the, he's, he's got what we call the primogenitor, right? right? He's got the primogenitor. That was what the terminology was. That means he was probably the eldest son, and he was going to get a double portion, and he was going to be the executor of the will. Plus, of course, he's also going to have responsibility for all sisters, all the rest of the family and surviving widow, he's going to have to administrate all of the house. He's got to do it all. So he's given more. And the younger brother, only thing he had to do was just get a regular portion and go about his way and do anything he wanted. But that wasn't what he wanted. Do you remember another story where there was an inheritance in the Bible that was, that was talked about? Another parable. What, which one? 
prodigal son. You remember? We just we covered that one not long ago. And it was about the prodigal son who he was the younger son. And he said to his father, Father, give me my inheritance. And I, that's all there is to it. I don't care if you drop dead. Just give me my inheritance. I'm out of here. I'm done with this place. I'm gone. And, uh, you know, older brother, he can have it all. I don't care. So that's what happened. The older brother, he stayed home. He worked hard. He did have a lot more work to do. He did. He stayed home. He worked hard. He kept serving and he had a double portion. Uh, but the younger brother went out. So this inheritance thing was a big deal. So this evidently this younger brother is trying to get Jesus to step in and use his ability and authority to enrich this younger brother. Let's fast forward to the 21st century and let's think about how people approach God and approach Jesus. Let me guide you down this thought path just a little bit. Um, he asked the Lord to side with him and provide influence and ammunition against his brother so he could get more of what dad had. Like many today, he wanted Jesus to give him more monetarily and materially. Now, I've, you know, I'm not picking a fight with anybody, but the health, wealth, and prosperity mentality that thinks that that really is God's job and that's what Jesus is supposed to do. And by the way, that's why I came to Jesus in the first place. I wanted him to fix my situation. I'm just not getting as much out of this life as I would like. I don't have as many friends as I would like. I'm not getting as enough. I don't have as much money as I would like. And hey, if he's going to be my savior and God is king and owner of all, how come I can't have more? Things don't change much, do they? Nope. <laughs> the more they change, the more they stay the same. Right? Yep. So Jesus did this. Now I want you to look at the passage of the Scripture. It says, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Does that, does that surprise you that Jesus said that? Does that surprise you that he said that? Who made me? A, does that mean in general or in this matter? In this matter. Uh, in this matter. Is he the judge? Well, the Bible says that he's the judge of all the earth. He's, he's going to come back and everybody's going to stand before him. Uh, and it's actually called, even for Christians, the judgment seat of Christ. And so, yes, now watch this now. Um, Jesus recused himself as an arbitrator in such cases. So if people come and say, I'm just going to go to Jesus, I'm going to go to God, and I'm just going to pray, 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 that he'll just work it out, and my brother will give me more, or my mom will give me more, I'll have the... No guarantee that that's going to happen. Now watch. He recused himself as an arbitrator in such cases. Now this kind of task has nothing to do for the reason for which he came. I found a new, I found a new commentator that I'm, I'm beginning to really like. His name is Leon Morris. He wrote, Jesus came to bring man to God, not to bring property to man. Let that sink in. Jesus came to earth to bring man to God. Take away our sins. Take away the impediment. Take away the obstacle. He came to bring man to God, not to bring property and possessions to man. Wow, that's... That's going to thin the herd. <laughs> yeah, well, it happened in Jesus' day, and it certainly happens today. Second, he addressed the multitudes, including his disciples, and he said this. Now watch. Look what he said. He, th then he said to him, who made me a judge or an arbiter over these, and he said, take heed. He said to them. See the word them? In this case, I think it's everybody there that's listening. Disciples, lost people, anybody and everybody. He said to them... Take heed, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consent, consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Would you drop down to verse number 22? And then he said to his disciples. So notice the difference. He said to the man, the individual man who said, make my older brother share the inheritance with me or give me a bigger portion. He talked to one man, and then he said to them, I believe that's everybody that's present, and then he said something specific to his disciples about how he's going to take care of them and how they're going to have every need that they have taken care of. Very important for us to get that. Now watch, we're going to look at this story. It's really amazing. He says, take heed, uh, watch out, 
Uh, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. That is the diametric opposite of what the world would like to tell us today. Madison Avenue would like, to, like us to be convinced that the only road to happiness and fulfillment is with more, newer, bigger, and better. I mean, they spend all of their time trying to convince us that that's what we need. Now watch. Um, so we need, we, need, we need this. The word take heed in this passage. Watch out in the NIV. Beware in the NASB. The truth is this should be a billboard. <laughs> you know, I mean, this word beware, watch out, take care. It should be a billboard outside car dealerships, real estate offices, investment banks, and on every website that deals with Wall Street investing. Beware because a man's life does not consist of how much, how big, how many, and more. It just doesn't. And so it should be an automatic mental response when greed, envy, or jealousy invades our thinking. Uh, we ought to be, have that watch out just bounce to our minds. So now let's talk about this for a minute. Greed. There was a movie that came out that Michael Douglas, Douglas was in where he was playing the part of a guy named Ivan Bosky. How many of you ever heard the story of Ivan Bosky? He was a he was a guy, he was $100 million, he stole $100 million on Wall Street somehow, and he got caught. And, and uh, his famous speech was, greed is good. Because if, gre if I, the greedier I am, the harder I work, and the more jobs I make for other people, because my greed is going to increase my money, which increases my investment, which makes jobs. I mean, greed is good. He, he talked about it. Greed, you know, in greed inhibits our judgment. It does. If you've ever had anyone come up to you and say, I know I got a good stock tip for you. Yeah. If you just give me $100, I can make that $1,000 in a yep. week. Yeah. Well, it does. It does inhibit and our you're judgment. Go for it. Yeah, that's right. So now think about us even as Christians. Think about this for a moment. We tend to label some gross sins as super wicked, but we seem to give a pass on the sin of avarice. I mean, if we talk about, I mean, oh man, God forbid, adultery or homosexuality or sodomy or or we talk about, you know, we talk about uh, murder, or we talk about rape, we talk about pedophilia, we talk, oh, just, you know, I mean, just, we're, we're just, we go berserk. But greed is far more sly. And greed grabs a hold of many of us. We give a pass to avarice, which is covetousness, it's greed, it's a consuming desire to have more. The question is, when is, en when is it enough? When do we say sufficient? Um, what we're dealing with, I used to call it, I preached a sermon on this called the monster of more one time. It's just a monster. It eats and it just wants more and more. We give into it. We become the monster of more. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.10, Solomon, and Solomon, by the time he wrote Ecclesiastes, he was just fed up with life. Remember that? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He said, what's the use? You know, we work ourselves to death. We make a lot of money. And who knows if my son that I leave it to is going to have any brains and know what to do with it. I mean, this is Solomon talking. He just went on and on. Here's what he said. He said this in, Solomon, in Ecclesiastes 5.10. He said, he who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with the increase. It's never enough. It's just vanity. This man in this passage was dealing with covetousness. He wanted more of what his brother had, and he wanted Jesus to intervene to get it for him. Now, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but how many of us sometimes in our life think we just didn't get quite the fair shake some other people did, and we just like to have a little more? We just like to have things better. Now, uh, let's, let's just put it in there that we're working as hard as we can, we're investing as best we can, we're not foolish, but we just can't seem to get to that level of comfort where we're not worried about, you know, tomorrow, next week, next month. And so we wish we just had a little bit more. Well, worry. I think Jesus had something to say about that as well. Didn't yeah, he? he's going to say it here in just a minute. So, all right, so this man was dealing with that. And so Jesus tells this amazing story. It's a parable to illustrate the danger of the sin of greed. Better read it. You got your Bible open? I got mine. I've got my papers out here. Where do you want to start? Uh, we need to read verse 13 through 21. Right. No, no, not 13. Let's read uh, verse number 16 through 15. 21. All right, 16 through 21. All right. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning with himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I'll do. 
I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. Mm. The rich fool. So the man had a bumper of crop. Um, and it is common that wealth begets wealth. And so he, he already had land of his own. He already had a crop. Now he gets a bumper crop. It's huge. And um, it's, it seems like those who have a lot are able to make a lot even more than those who don't. Uh, do you remember the talents? Five talents, two talents, one talent. How many talents did the five talent guy make? Five more. Five more. How many talents did the two talent guy make? He didn't make two five more. more. He made two more. How many talents did the one talent guy make? None. None. You know, he was just mad about the whole thing and he just hid the talent. Now, talent was a lot of money. One talent was a lot of money. The one guy had five and he got five more. The one guy had two and he got, I mean, it just seems like this. It seems like wealth begets wealth. So this is very, very important for us to look at. Now, I want to just say something from the outset. Nowhere in this passage is, his, is he criticized for his wealth. We have an automatic mindset sometimes that we think, well, if somebody's wealthy, they're evil, they're bad, they're terrible. I think it's happening in America yep. more and more and more. I think politicians are playing on that. Even those wealthy politicians are acting like they're not wealthy, and they're talking about people who are wealthy it's amazing. But anyway, Hypocrites, it's so, yeah. oh really? So, so here, here's the thing. So Jesus doesn't criticize him for his wealth. The parable is not about that it is evil to be wealthy. Can you think of any wealthy people in the Bible who are greatly blessed by God? Does anybody know? Abraham. Job, Abraham, who else? King David wasn't a pauper. How about Solomon? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, he'd be, you know, he, was, well, he wasn't wealthy the right way, but, but he wasn't wealthy. <laughs> Who else? Anybody else know any other wealthy people in the Bible? Remember Daniel? We don't think of Daniel as being wealthy, but remember, he's a guy with a gold chain around his neck. And what about Joseph? Did he get wealthy? Oh, he was second in, I mean, he was second in, second in Egypt, and Egypt was ruling the world at that time. I mean, he was number two. He's prime minister. He he could have done anything he wanted, had anything he wanted. Money was no object. He was just, he was extremely, extremely wealthy. Now, I'm not trying to point out that, you know, wealth is the evidence of God's blessing because some of the most blessed people in the world have, all, have been poor. But just wait just a moment here. This passage of Scripture is not a condemnation of somebody who does well. It's not. Let me go on. Um, his wealth is not criticized. And then secondly, his increase is not criticized. By the way, that bumper crop, who made the rain fall on it? Who made it happen in the first place? God did. You know, sometimes our wealth is more of a test than it is a blessing, isn't it? And so, but he's not, he's not criticized because, he got, because, he, because of his increase. Uh, this is so important. Even his actions are not criticized. You say, wait a minute, you're acting like this guy did everything right. Well, he built bigger barns if you had... <laughs> I mean, it happens all the time. Do you know, going out towards your house, Aaron, going out to your house on the right-hand side in the harvest time when there's been too much corn and they can't, what, you know, the out there going out to your, there's this big thing out there. It looks like they stretch this queen all over the ground. I'm sure it's not that, but all, and they pile up the corn. It's just piles of corn piled up out there and it's just amazing. And finally, they finally get it gathered up and they get it into barns, get it sold. I don't know what they do. But, I mean, the increase wasn't wrong, and even the idea of not letting this corn go to waste, you know, I know what I'll do, I'll build bigger barns, that was not necessarily criticized. You say, what was criticized? His assumption. What assumption did he make in the story? Now, come on. You guys know, you folks out there, you know, you can't, I can't hear you, but you can say it out loud, you can think ahead. What was the assumption that this guy made? He said it right out of his mouth. What was the assumption? Tim, do you know what his assumption was? What is it? He's going, to, he's going to live a long time. And because of this bumper crop 
And because of all of this extra, he is going to be able to eat, drink, drink, and be merry. So he thought, here's the assumption that he made. He thought he had tomorrow bought and paid for. No matter how much money we have in the bank, it guarantees nothing about our future. It does not, it guarantees that there's money for tomorrow, but it doesn't guarantee there's life for tomorrow. That's pretty important. Yes. You deal with a lot of people all the time. Do you ever have people fighting over money? (laughs) I just wondered. I know that's what he does. I was just going to say, many people make a living off the greed of others. Yeah, that's exactly right. (laughs) Now watch this. Now here's what happens. This, there's three things that define this man. Three things that define him. The first is selfishness. He says, I, I, I. He's taking counsel with himself. He said, I, six times. His purpose was to indulge himself. He owed it to himself. He was the chief end of all that he had, communi- that he had accumulated. I'm accumulating all this stuff, and it's for me. See, I, and then there's another word, he's selfish and he's materialistic. You say, what what do you mean? Well, he had had barns and bigger barns and more barns. And so the quality of his future was linked to the size of his barns. Well, I know people today that the quality of their future is linked to the size of their RV or the size of their, or the, the quality or cost of their automobile or the size of their house or how much their stocks are worth. I mean, that is what that materialism, the the quality of life is linked to the size of the barns. And so if I have more and more, I will be happier and happier. This is what he thought. If I just, I mean, when, when is it enough? You know, John D. Rockefeller was asked one time, you know, you know who Rockefeller was? John D. Rockefeller was asked one time, when's it going to be enough? And he says, when I get another dollar. When I get another dollar, it'll be enough. There was always another dollar. So he just kept on and kept on and kept on. Here's what he said. He said, I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Selfishness, materialism, decadence or debauchery. We don't use that word very much. Self-indulgence, hedonism. All of these words fit. Hedonistic self-indulgent, full of debauchery, decadence. He said, take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And that's what life was about for him. Tomorrow was bought and paid for. He's got no worries. I can afford to live it up. I can do anything I want. He reveled in his wealth. He did. And you know, uh, I am for everybody to enjoy life. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. You say, well, are we just supposed to just hate life and despise it and Never take a trip, never buy anything. No, that's not, that's not the point at all. It hasn't got anything to do with that. But there are people who are either just getting off of a cruise, they are on a cruise, or they're planning their next cruise, or they're worrying because they hadn't got a cruise in the future. I mean, there are people, it, it, there's, they, they, if, it's, it's totally wrapped up in the next excursion in pleasure. That's who this man was. So now, let's not make another mistake as we talk about this. God has not called for Christians to take a vow of poverty. You say, Pastor Phil, you preached last week that if we don't give up all that we have, that we can't be his disciple. Exactly. I didn't say, the Bible doesn't say if you don't give away all that you have. It doesn't say that. It says give it up. Stop being the owner. Become the administrator. Be a steward of all you have. But even the stewards ate of what they had, of what God provided. It's so important for us to understand this. Don't make another mistake. God has not called for a vow of poverty. There is nothing glorious about making yourself poor on purpose. There's only one person who glorified himself in all of history by making himself poor so that we might become rich. And who was that? Jesus. 
He divested himself of his spirit existence in heaven, took on the form of a servant, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, so that he could die in our place. So he made himself poor so that we might be made rich. There's nothing glorious about making ourselves monetarily poor. Covetousness, covetousness, by the way, or greed or avarice is not only the sin of the wealthy. Poor people can be very, very, very covetous. I lived in the nation of Peru, and I can tell you that among some of the areas that I worked in, you would not believe what the difference of $10 in somebody's pocket might make for them. The way they looked at somebody who didn't have $10. Oh, it was amazing. And so I can go on, and I'll just leave it right here. So then, again, Paul taught us this. He taught us that God provides everything for our enjoyment. So make sure you get this. Listen to this, listen to this passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians um, I won't look that one up. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 17. Uh, but I will have you look up first Timothy chapter six and verse 17. First Timothy chapter six and verse 17. I think it's right over here. One second. I thought I had it marked, but I didn't. All right. It says in first Timothy chapter six and verse 17, it says this command those who are rich in this present age, not to be haughty, that means proud, not to trust in uncertain riches. Don't be like this man in this parable, trusting in your riches. But then he said this, he said, um, but in the living God, and look at the final part of that, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. Enjoy. You know, Americans, many of us are getting to the place where we bought so many toys we don't even have time to play with all of them. Now just think this for a minute. If you if you have an RV, use it. If you can afford a cruise, have at it. And if you have a fishing boat, shame on you for not inviting your pastor to come go fishing with you. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. Yeah, I'm just simply saying use it. Enjoy it. Be blessed. It's not wrong. If you're able to do these things, of course, share, be a blessing with it. Make everything a tool for God's glory and for his kingdom. But on the other hand, it is not wrong. Paul, uh, Paul said clearly he's given us everything for our enjoyment. So the issue in the passage is the mistake of assuming that you have tomorrow bought and paid for. That laying up riches for tomorrow equals taking care of your soul for eternity. Look at the very words that are used in the passage. He said, uh, he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, he, he confused his bodily provisions for his soul provisions. You don't provide for your soul with dollars or with grain or with anything else material, your soul can only be provided for in a spiritual way by the blood of Jesus, forgiveness of sins, and a personal daily walk with Him. That is so very, very, very important that we understand that. Command those who are rich in this pleasant age not to be haughty nor trust in the riches. That's the other part of that verse. Don't trust in the riches. So this man's view of life can be heard in phrases like this. Have you ever heard these phrases? Listen to these phrases. If I am not good to myself, no one will be good to me. Or success with possessions shows my success as a person. The bigger the barn, the better the life. We might say it, the bigger the house, the more expensive the toys. But that's what he thought. The bigger the barn, the better the life. Next. The more storage units you have. There you go. How many of you are amazed how many storage, they're everywhere. These storage units, they're building those things as fast as they are apartments. I mean, they're everywhere, you know. And so, and I'm actually amazed to see some of the people who have storage units. I was up in Ankeny, they got one called Green Acres right by my house. When I say Green Acres, what do you think of? Green, green Acres is the place <laughs> Stop. <to be. laughs> but anyway, Farmland Green Acres is right there. Green. And, and, and I, and I, the, I I kid you not, somebody pulled up there the other day in a jalopy. I felt, how in the world are they, how can they possibly have anything to put in the storage unit? Because it didn't look like the car would, the, the, this old pickup truck with a trailer behind it would hardly even go down the road. Uh, it's amazing. Anyway, let me go on. So, 
This man's view of life can be heard in these phrases, the bigger the barn. And then maybe, here's the big one, maybe money can't buy happiness, but it can sure buy pleasure and security. So just some of the thoughts. God said to him, you're a fool. You are not in control of the length of your life. Tonight you die. And what will happen to your stuff? Now, you know, the Bible says that we're not supposed to call other people a fool. But I think this is God's prerogative because he knows all information. He knows, he knows every angle of every story. He is the faithful and true witness First in, in Revelation chapter 1. And he called this man a fool. Now, please do not misunderstand. That did not mean he was in intellectually deficient or he had some mental disorder. No, he had no spiritual discernment. None. He had no, now maybe he was a lost man, but I, I've been in the ministry long enough to say that there's a lot of people who profess Christianity that make some of the most amazing decisions I have ever seen, could ever contemplate that leave me with my, I mean, my face hanging out when I hear them say what they did and the reasoning that led them to do what they did on the basis of that seven, you know, that $74,000 pickup truck that they just had to have. And there were reasons. And they, it wasn't like a company bought it. It's like their payments are bigger than their house payment. I've seen many of those. I bet you've dealt with a few of those, haven't you? <laughs> Where it caused trouble in the family, oh, huh? Oh, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Now, the diagnosis of the rich fool by God. Here it is. He's a fool, not a success. He thought he was a success. God says, you're not a success. You're a fool. We're not talking about the lack of gray matter. This is something else. No matter what his peers or his community said of him or how many congratulations we, he was awarded, God says you lack spiritual discernment. It is a fool who acts and lives as if there is no God. That was Psalm 14, 1 and 57, 1. It says 11 times in this passage, he says, I and my. I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 49. Turn your Bible to Psalm 49. Time's getting away from me here. I got to get over here and get this done. Psalm 49. This is an amazing, amazing passage of Scripture. Look at verse number 6. Psalm 49, 6. I mean, if this guy would have just read his Bible, read his Torah that he had, read some of the Psalms, listen to this verse 6. Of course, we have these same Psalms. Are we reading them? Verse 6. Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. What sounds fatal, doesn't it? He should not see the pit. For he sees wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless person perish, and they leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses will last. Now listen to this now. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever. Their dwelling places to all generation. They call their lands after their own names. Hmm. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He's like the beast that perish. So the steward naming the land after himself. Hmm. That's probably not a wise move. Nope. So he's a fool, not a success. Next, he's a servant. He's not a master. He thinks he's a master. He thinks he's got everything, got the tiger by the tail, so to speak. He has worked so hard for so little. He was planning for time and not planning for eternity. He left his barns. He left the power and the money that, that, that it wields. He left the prestige all behind because he was not rich toward God. He was not in charge of all he had amassed. So I have to ask myself, if I'm a, am I a fool in God's eyes? This parable unmasked the folly. God doesn't matter. I can't get enough. Possessions may give temporary power, but they do not give permanence. Let's think about that. God doesn't matter, and I can't get enough. That's pretty much what this guy was saying. God doesn't matter, and I can't get enough. Mm. Wow. The parable can also reveal unbelief in us, his disciples. We might not think that God cares for us. We might be tempted to think that, that, we, that, is, that when, if we give up ownership, we won't have enough ourselves. 
On another occasion, when Jesus was warning about the danger of putting our confidence in wealth, he said this in Mark chapter 10. Peter began to say to him, he was telling, don't put your confidence in wealth. Follow me and, and, and all will be well. Peter said to him, look, we have left all and followed you. Jesus did not mince words. He said to Peter, and here's what he said. Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. See, God promises to take care of his own. He promises to take care of his people. Peter said, hey, we've forsaken all. You told us to, deny, you know, give it all up, take up our cross and follow you. Now, what, what are we going to have? He said, Peter, you're going to have everything you need. This is so very important. Notice what Jesus says to his disciples, and we've got to finish this up. He says to his disciples over there now, back in the passage that we're looking at in Luke 12, he says to his disciples, I'm going to read it quickly. Therefore, verse 22, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Consider the raven, they're birds, and so on. And then he says, and which of you by worrying can add anyone, you know, one cubit to, cubit to his stature? If you that are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Then he says, consider the lilies, consider the birds, I'm taking care of them. Consider the lilies. They grow, and they don't do anything to grow. They just do it. And then uh, he says in verse 28, If God so clothes the grass which is today in the field, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need it. Verse 31. This is similar to Matthew six thirty-three. Verse 31, but seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have. Give alms. Provide yourself money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in heaven that does not fail where no thief approaches nor moth destroys for where your treasure is. What does it say? There will your heart be also, what an amazing, amazing passage of Scripture. Let me go through this quickly. This is um, God continuing to teach the Word, and uh, it, He teaches the whole counsel. We read the part about take up your cross and follow me, and you know, give up everything you have, and give it up to me, and become stewards and administrators. And you hear all of that, and, but if you don't teach the whole counsel, you don't read the rest of it, which says, don't worry, don't fear. You're worth more than the birds. You're worth more than the lilies. You're worth more. Listen, you are mine, and I've taken you to myself, and I promise to take care of you. Sometimes we don't teach the whole section. And so last week in the passage, we looked at, at what the cost of discipleship was. We stated the three cases. This week, we see the balancing promise that God takes care of both our temporal and eternal needs. We read it. This section is addressed to his disciples. So first he addressed the avarice, the man full of avarice. Then he addressed the whole crowd, warning them that a man's life is not made up or a woman's life is not made up by how much you have or own or how big your bank account. Then he speaks specifically to his disciples and the tone completely changes. Don't worry. Don't fret. Follow me. Serve me. Uh, make sure you're not a fool. Don't depend on your barns. Don't depend on your wheat. Don't depend on your bank. Don't depend on those things. Depend on me. Follow me and serve me with all that you have. And so worry is a common besetting sin of Christ followers. You say, why would you say that? How many times does the Bible say don't worry or don't fret? Well, I've been told it's 365 times. One for every day of the week, well, every day of the year, you know, just missing one for leap year. I wonder what we're going to do on that day. But don't fret. Don't worry. Uh, the Bible says that. Self-denial and trust in Christ completely might make us ask, will Jesus truly meet all of my needs? And I've had people tell me that. I say, you know, if I give the Lord a portion of my money, and I've got to just be honest to everybody here and everybody out there is watching. You know, we started this COVID thing and people rallied and everybody did good. But I'm telling you, 
It's falling off. All this, I don't know what's happened. Employment's going up and the, the, the offering has gone down. And I, I'm just sharing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Self-denial and trusting Christ completely might make us ask this question, will Jesus truly meet all of my needs? Well, if he won't, then he's broken a promise. Can he break a promise? Let's be clear. Worry, watch this now. I want to, be, I want to clarify this idea of worry. Worry is, it is not the presence of appropriate concern for life's responsibilities. We are supposed to appropriately be concerned. We are not birds. We're people. And, you know, God may feed the birds and feed the ravens, but he doesn't throw the food in their nest. They have to, you know, go out and hunt for it and find it. There's a bunch of trees behind my house where I live right now. And all through the summer, they've all gone now. But all through the summer, I'd take my silly little dog out early in the morning. And we would both sit there and wait on the same event every morning at about 5.55. We would go out there and you just hear these thousands of starlings. I mean, maybe tens of thousands of starlings. They start waking up. I mean, you just hear the noise gets louder and louder and louder and louder. Then all of a sudden, whoosh, they all go. And Mancha just sits there and just looks at them. She thinks that's the greatest thing ever. She'll bark at them. You know, and those birds are going, well, who's feeding those birds? God is. But is he throwing the food in the trees? And, you know, worry is, doesn't mean we don't take appropriate concern for life. It doesn't mean if it's a, you know, a snowstorm, I run around in a T-shirt. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean that, you know, if, if I've heard that, you know, there's going to be a tornado, it doesn't mean I don't need to go in the basement and get away from the danger. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the appropriate action is the appropriate action in every circumstance. But worry is exaggerated, undue concern, even thinking about things that might happen, that haven't happened. And it's, it's just, it is, it is a failure to believe, a failure to trust. Let me go on. He's not asking us to, li- to eat a bird's life. But he is asking us to trust him as we serve him. I think Mary and Martha give us a real good picture of this. You guys know Mary and Martha in the Bible. Which one was supposed to be too busy to really be spiritual? Which one was that? Martha. Martha. And which one was supposed to be really, really spiritual? Mary. Mary. Well, Mary, in one occasion when Jesus came through Bethany and he was at the house and he was teaching, Martha, Martha just kept on serving, cleaning, fixing, preparing. Mary sat at his feet. Martha was upset and said, hey, will you please tell Mary? It sounds like this other guy with the inheritance. Will you please tell Mary to get up and get busy? He says, Martha, Martha, you're just all upset. And you're all worried about all kinds of stuff. You're distracted. She's chosen the better thing for this moment. Just sit down here. But don't get it in your mind that it was always like that. Because when Lazarus died, Mary and Martha did exactly the same thing. Why didn't you come? Where were you? If you'd have been here... My brother wouldn't die. You don't love us. You don't care. Wow. Ouch. So Mary and Martha. The point is, is that there's a time to be. Mar- there's a time to be like Martha. That would have been when Jesus is on the way to the house. And there's a time to be like Mary when there's an opportunity to sit and worship and enjoy the presence of Jesus. That's the time to do it. But um, we're we, we're not supposed to worry. And Martha was worried when she shouldn't have been worried. So why should we not worry? Well, verse 22 to 24 tell us this, because worry is foolish. Worry is foolish. And he didn't say we're fools if we worry. He just says it's a foolish action. Why? It's to forget that we are God's precious children of much more value than birds. God takes care of the birds. We are of much more value than birds. Next, worry is futile. He said, why is that? He says you can't add to your height and you can't add to your life. You just can't. It won't add to it. People get ulcers not so much from what they eat, but from what's eaten them. It's so important that we don't let worry get a hold of us. We're, we're not supposed to be careless, but we are supposed to be trustful. Trust the Lord, and He is the object of our trust. Worry is faithless. Verse 29 to 31, to be ruled by worry and anxiety is ultimately to be unbelieving. And unbelieving is a very offensive thing. To our God, to not believe Him. Let me flip over to Psalm 78 here, and uh, it's just absolutely amazing. Psalm 78, verse 17. It says, uh, Now, this is a whole record of the children of Israel from the time He delivered them from Egypt 
to the time that they crossed the Red Sea. They went into the desert of uh, the desert of Saudi Arabia, and they wandered around all those years, and God took care of them miraculously. He answered their prayer over and over. He gave them food to eat. It was amazing. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High God in the wilderness. And they tested God in the desert by asking for the food of their fancy. That's an interesting way to put that. They didn't didn't want, you know, manna. They wanted T-bone steak. And so they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? And he struck the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Instead of saying God can, they kept saying can God. They were doubting him. Therefore, it says the Lord heard this and was furious. Do you you know unbelief (laughs) upsets our Heavenly Father? Not anything that is is upsetting to him is when his children, whom he has performed for perpetually, don't believe him. So to the disciples in relation to the subject of discussion, Jesus said, don't fear. Fear and anxiety are the twin sisters of worry. It is your father's good pleasure, it says in this passage, to give you the kingdom. You say, what in the world does that have to do with it? What does that mean to give us the kingdom? Well, That is, if he is going to make us co-heirs with Jesus and allow us to rule and reign with him on earth, do we not think that he's also going to take care of the needs that we have right now? Would he not also take care of us right now? Romans 32, he who did not spare his own, uh, 832, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And if he clothes the lilies, feeds the birds, and everything and everyone else, will he not give us what we need? So this man, this, this, this guy with the barns, with a bumper crop, what was the deal? What, what, what did he do wrong? Well, God is not going to call anyone a fool like he called him a fool if, if we choose limits and not luxury so that we can invest in heaven. He's not going to call us a fool if we cultivate compassion and not greed. He's not going to call us a a fool if we pursue confidence in God and not money. Trust Him. So I wrote something at the bottom of the page here. We all know that we have on our money, it's printed, In God We Trust. Uh, This author wrote, we should not just trust God on our money. We should trust Him with our money. How about that? So what did the guy do wrong? Maybe you struggle. Maybe I struggle. Let me, let me just give you a few things. What was the story with this fool? Why was the rich man a fool? One, he took counsel with himself and not God. He assumed all was for him without consideration of others. He confused his body with his soul. He lived for time and not for eternity. And he lived for his own pleasure, not for God's glory. He is a fool. No spiritual discernment, no understanding, no true understanding of the value of God's goodness. So there's another startling story from Jesus. What, what, what startles you the most about the story? Well, I don't know if it's startling or not, but I can certainly understand why he, uh, Jesus changed his direction uh, to the apostles uh, during this uh, passage because the apostles had dropped everything and they followed him. That's right. They left their work, they left their families, and they were just following around. So they had to be concerned. Mm -hmm. How am I going to eat? How are we going to eat? Where are we going to stay? What are we going to do? And then I see Jesus just calms them down and says, hey. Your Lord's going to take care of you. You're a lot better off than the guy with the barns. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. So, and then uh, it's it's just, life is so uncertain, and you can go at any time. Mm -hmm. We do not know uh, Mm. when that time's going to be. You know, my my neighbor came home uh, one day and uh, found his wife dead in the shower. Oh, wow. uh, Less than 50 years old. And so you don't know. Mm. Uh, Bill was telling me today, one of his neighbors, 33 years old, just had a brain aneurysm and died. Wow. It's just gone. So you've, you've got to 
always be looking toward your eternal destiny, mm. not just your comfort here. Mm. Yeah. So, what should we? What What should our attitude be then? You know, I mean. Uh, in the study, we talked about the fact that God didn't condemn the wealth. He didn't condemn the increase. He didn't even condemn him building bigger barns. But he condemned this, this assumption, this attitude that because he had provisions, therefore he had a future. You know what I'm saying? Because I have provided all the So is it saying to us, let's don't work, let's don't save? Or is he, or is he saying, what's he saying? What do you think he's really saying right there? Well, don't be so selfish and self-centered because your life here on earth is not about you. Mm -hmm. So you can go at any time. You know, I don't think this guy would have lived any longer had he been generous, mm -hmm. had he helped the church, as he, as, had he worshipped God and, and mm -hmm. lived for him. He probably still would have died at the same time. Mm -hmm. But, but he'd, had some, he'd have had some internal investments. Yeah, he would have yeah. been uh, spending eternity with God rather mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. the fire. What do you think? Fits. What's your observation? Anybody out there? What's, what is it about the story that really gets your attention? Anybody? Not all at once, please. Yes, Joe. In other words, is the, the joy from entertainment would not have matched the joy from sharing and seeing other people provided for. Joe? Yeah, he did. He took credit for, for God's provision. That's right. Yep. <laughs> Very good. I saw another hand right back there. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, uh, Lou. There's, there's an old saying that a man with most toys still dies. And yeah. Just, it wasn't in your direction. Mm. Where are you going to see? Mm. Are you trying to accomplish a lot of toys and mm -hmm. things in this world? Mm. Or are you trying to establish mm. what you should be? Mm -hmm. Where you should be going? Mm. Mm. That's right. Very good. Well, Jim, quickly, where people are, can't hear us, I don't think, on the outside there. Go ahead. Yep. That's right. But that was on Psalm 49. Right. Yeah, so I pulled that back in into this passage right here because it was a perfect illustration of this story right here. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed tonight. Thank all of you for being here. Thank you for being with us out there on live stream. And uh, we're, I'm going to read some of your comments here in a few minutes, see what's going on. But let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of your word. And uh, Lord, there is something to, something for us to learn. I mean, these are 2,000-year-old stories that are told, but they seem as up-to-date as tomorrow morning's newspaper because avarice and greed just never go away. And God, I pray, Father, that we would be rich towards you, that is, by being willing to take those things that you've given to us and share, to invest in eternal things and in people, and God, not just in our own pleasure. God, thank you for your goodness. Uh, bless all of these that have gathered tonight and help us to regather again for another Table Talk next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.